Um, a couple points, I just follow up a little bit on the earlier discussion. It is really critical that everybody in here leaves here today with a clear understanding of that last slide that, that Craig showed because even though we just take it for granted, there's so many terms and stuff out there. We hear it called friendly fescue. We hear it called non-toxic fescue. Either of those could be either endophyte free or, not, or, or the novel endophyte. I mean, there's nothing there that says it's got this special endophyte in it. So one of the benefits of the alliance that has come out of this is that a lot of us collaborate together and, and talk about stuff like terminology. Let's all call it the same thing, just so that as we have a conversation, everybody knows what we're talking about. And so the convention that we've agreed to is novel endophyte fescue. So you'll hear that all, you'll, it's starting to come out automatically now, Dennis, instead of trying to make sure that you say that instead of non-toxic or something like that. So, uh, so that's what we're talking about. But this is another example of this collaboration. This is a spreadsheet that Joe Horner uh, put together, the, the, all of this is based on the spreadsheet he created first, but then we sat down as a group with about, I don't know, Craig, maybe a dozen of us every time we looked through this and debated what's the real cost of things and, and that sort of thing, and he kind of had come up with what Missouri numbers would be, and, and we were like, well, wait a minute, you know, he was spouting out some numbers that didn't make sense to me. So we had a long discussion about this, and just want to credit that Gabe Pent, John Andre, Dennis Hancock, Jeff Limkuler, and Dave, Dave Davis we're all involved in, uh, heavily involved in looking at this and creating this. Uh, and so that's the idea of the alliance is to get our heads together and come up with one message rather than having mixed messages whenever you read or, or hear somebody talk about this. So the goals of the economics team uh, that developed this presentation were to create this transparent decision tool, or, or in other words, a spreadsheet with an agreed upon methodology and the input costs so that we could look at cost and benefit of replacing infected fescue with, uh, uh, of toxic fescue with novel endophyte uh, and, and, and come up with some clear consensus on what the costs and, and are going to be. And then to communicate that uh, so, so that producers that take this on and make the decision to convert, they really do know the economics and why they're doing it and there's some basis for that. I'll make a comment about that at the very end of what I think about uh, basing everything on economics, but we'll uh, we'll, we'll, we'll proceed uh, under that uh, goal this morning. So the objectives, I'm going to review the three renovation strategies, and I think, John, you're going to actually talk about four a little bit, but there were three major renovation strategies we agreed were the big ones that we wanted to talk about, so I'll, I'll talk about those a little bit. I'm going to explain the, the spreadsheet, and for those of the grad students and, and, and agents and stuff sitting in here that advise farmers, uh, I'll, I'll make some comments about that for you. You all know how to use spreadsheets, and this is a good one. Um, we want to compare the costs in Missouri with what costs here are on the East Coast, because we found that that was a big, uh, a big thing we had to discuss. Uh, we're going to talk about how stocking rate, pasture productivity, and possible combinations of things that might be uh, existing on a farm would go into thinking about how the economics turn out. And then we're going to end by spotlighting what are the key economic drivers in this decision. What, you know, what is it that, uh, that, that is going to make us decide whether or not to, to renovate. So I want to start by, by just making clear that this whole effort is not, uh, is not as anti-Kentucky 31 as you might think. Most of us have had a lot of experience with Kentucky 31 tall fescue. Uh, this particular scene is from my home farm. But uh, this is very, very, very poor soil, tobaccoed out for centuries. It's, it's just very, it's a very poor, you can't crop anything on here, but fes tall fescue, Kentucky 31 in this case, does great. And I grew up on that farm where the pastures were planted before I was born, and they're still there. So talk about persistence, right? That's what we would all, uh, you know, there's a lot of great things about this plant, and from a conservation standpoint, this farm would not be what it is if they hadn't planted that Kentucky 31 back then. Because there was no, I mean, this was just all barren, cropped out, just really, really poor quality stuff. And, and now it's, it grows a lot of grass and a lot of beef. So uh, it makes a great solar collector and a rainfall collector. And that's the most important thing in these pasture-based systems. So keep that in mind. We're not going to be totally, totally anti-Kentucky 31. And you'll see why I'm saying that later in the talk. So let's talk about the costs and benefits. We've all seen pictures like this. This is from a study that we did with developing heifers. Uh, those gains that, that you showed earlier was from this, these cattle. And, and it's, it, I mean, it's like night and day. You just walk out there, and you're like, man, what's wrong with those cattle? 
And when you see them side by side like that, it really, really makes a big, a big point in people's minds. But most people are used to looking at this all the time, and they're just like, well, that's what my cows always look like. What's, you know, this just doesn't, we live with it our whole life. So if we're going to replace this, we've got to think about the costs, and they can be broken out into, you know, what's it going to cost to kill the, the, the fescue to begin with, the pasture that's there. Uh, there's costs associated with planting the smother crop, uh, planting the novel uh, fescue once you get that ready. And then a, a very important piece of this is the opportunity costs. And what we mean by that is when we kill a good pasture for the next year or so, we're not going to have any production from that. So Reed, you know, when you take out a pasture, you got to figure if, you, if you're stocked at the level that you can stock your farm, where's the feed going to come from for a year for those cattle? You have to buy hay or you have to do something to, to replace that. And so that's built into this. And we'll, th this is one of the things we're still talking about and debating because some farmers, I heard somebody say they're understocked. Well, if you're understocked, that's not a de that, that becomes not a big deal because you don't need all the grass that you're producing already anyway. You can give up some and, and be fine. Now we've got to talk about the benefits as well to balance this out. We know that we'll have improvements in weaning weight, improvements in breeding rate, and uh, reduce what we call extra input costs. And again, in the debate that we talked about, a lot of people feed some extra feed to try to mask or to mitigate the problems that the toxin causes. And so if you get rid of the toxins, a lot of times you can quit feeding. And an example is those replacement heifers. These heifers right here, um, my daddy would have just shot me if, if our heifers look like this. And the reason ours don't look like this is because we feed them about six pounds of grain a day. They're all during development. And so they would look more like this. They'd still be a little shaggy or whatever, but they'd have the body condition and they'd breed and everything because we feed the heck out of them. But on novel, you know, these heifers here gain like 1.6 pounds per day with no feed or anything, just a mineral. And so that's, you know, you can give up that cost if you can uh, get the toxins out of these cattle. So let's start with, start with these three renovation strategies because everything I'm going to say uh, will be built around this. And I'm, most of my talk actually is going to be built on the spray, summer smother, spray system. And we often hear this called just spray, smother, spray. And that involves a sorghum sudan or pearl millet are the two most desirable summer annuals for doing that with. And uh, you spray glyphosate in the, in, in the late spring, plant your summer smother crop, and then spray that out in the, in the late summer and then plant in the early fall. So that's the, that's the most common one and the one that we consider the standard. Uh, a one that was developed actually in Missouri and we kept it in because there's, there's quite a bit of this done in Missouri, less here, but they spray in the fall and then plant a winter smother like rye and then they come back in and they, they graze that out all the way into the late uh, spring. They spray it in the summer and then they plant in early fall. And then the spray, weight spray, which this was one actually that Nick and, and John did a lot of research. You'll hear more about it later when John talks. But that one uh, involves no smother crops. So you can imagine there's not that cost of the seed for the annual and that sort of thing. Basically, you just spray it in, uh, you control seed heads in the spring. You spray this once the, most of the fescue has kind of done its thing for the year. You spray it in uh, maybe midsummer and then come back and spray it again late summer and then that, that, that early fall planting. And so that one is uh, one that there's a lot of interest in for folks that are kind of in a bit of a hurry to get this done. You know, you don't want, or, or for one reason or another, don't want to deal with the summer smother crop. So the decision tool is a simple spreadsheet. Again, I think most of you have worked with spreadsheets, uh, but it's just basically a way to let the computer do a lot of calculations for you in a systematic way. And so uh, the way it's constructed, uh, we, we're looking at the outcome for these three renovation strategies that I just talked about. So there'll be some comparisons of those. And then there's four sections of the, uh, of the spreadsheet. There's the land preparation costs or the initial killing, uh, the planting costs uh, for the, the um, novel fescue, the opportunity costs, this idle land and smother crop costs and benefits, and then the payback or the outcome. So that's the, the four sections, and I'm going to kind of show you one slide for each of those. And I'm getting ready to break every rule of presentation uh, uh, etiquette, and that is I'm going to show you something with some small numbers on it. This is a very small room. You probably can see them. My point is just to let you know how this works, not to try to demonstrate the individual numbers on this. So don't, don't, uh, 
don't freak out that you can't read them. I'm not going to really talk about individual numbers, but just show you how this is created. And again, those of you that know spreadsheets, uh, the inputs are, are here along this side, and you see things like the custom chemical application, the cost of the chemicals, and, uh, and a lot of this, the seed for, the, uh, for the, uh, the smother crop, that sort of thing. There's a whole bunch of things you can put in here, the fertilizer, and all of those costs can be tracked. Now you see a lot of this stuff over here is zero. For example, lime, uh, we have zero, zero, zero. The assumption is that, it's, that the pH is good. So you, again, it's got to be customized to the farm because the pH is not always going to be good, but the pH is going to have to be controlled for each of these strategies. So that's something that uh, we just need to, uh, to just tell you that there are some things that will have to be filled in. Some people will have those costs, many will not. Now when we get to the fescue planting costs, Again, the, the seed, the custom planting, I'll just point out here, 350 a pound for uh, novel endophyte seed is pretty close to what the, the market is out there now. You can find some a little bit less than that, a little bit more. That price has come down some uh, from the last few years. But if you think about, if you, if you add that out and you figure what your state's recommendation, uh, in, in this case we're using 15, that's a, just a little over $50 for the seed. And we have a lot of people that say, well, I'm not going to plant it. That seed is so expensive. Well, look at the cost of any other seed that we have out here, and it's not really that expensive compared to alfalfa. It's, it's cheap. So, uh, so we, you know, I, I talk to a lot of producers about this, and they just say, oh, seed's too expensive. They don't, I say, well, how much is it? They don't even know. They've just been told that or heard that. And that's where we get this, hey, how about this one over here? It's a half the price. And it's, it's friendly fescue, too. So, that, again, we got to... This terminology thing, we get in trouble with some of these uh, some of these costs. But, but again, a uh, little bit of nitrogen is 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 definitely recommended in here. And the same comment about the fertility that we've got to think about how much that is actually going to cost us. Now, this is a little more complicated, and don't want you to get bogged down in this. But this is the section that that uh, we 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 in, we input a, a custom haymaking cost, value of pasture, and value of hay. And this is where we come up with that opportunity cost. So if you, uh, if I'll, just t I'll just point out one piece here and, and talk about this, but we know that we will have changes in yield in the spring, summer, and fall, and this is in, in year one. This is the, rent of the, the year that we run the smother crop in the summer, and so you can see here it's negative 23, which means we have less cow days to graze in the spring, and we have less cow days to graze in the, small, in the fall because we've killed that pasture, but we get a benefit from the summer smother crop, 90 extra cow grazing days. And so, again, we debated out all these numbers, but we can, uh, we can see that that, uh, that negative uh, is in the second year as well, and that's because we don't get the full yield out of this new pasture we planted. We've got to stay off of it. We'll get part of the yield, but certainly not all of it. And then by year three, you see this goes to zero, and that means that we're back to the same productivity that we had in the pasture before we started the renovation. And so that's, this is going to become important later on. So this is kind of the way it is defaulted, that we lose production the first two years, and then the third year we're back to where we were uh, to begin with. Now finally on the payback, uh, this is where we have to input what we expect our improvements to be. Uh, we have a place to put the stocking rate in there. Uh, we have uh, the, uh, the weight of the calves weaned, pre-renovation and after renovation, so about 52 pounds is the default there. A little less uh, price per pound on the feeder cattle because they're heavier, so we've got to account for that. We're assuming a 10% increase in the calf crop. And again, Craig, you showed data where it was like 48% bread versus 90%, and that would be a, almost a 50% increase in, in, in or 45% or increase in that, percent, uh, uh, we, uh, in that uh, improvement of the calf crop, and that's extreme. And, the, and, and, the, and so if I used that in this spreadsheet, you'd see it would pay back in less than one year to renovate your fescue. And you'd say, well, why would anybody do that? Well, somebody with only a 45% breeding rate is either out of business, they care so little that they're never going to do anything to try to improve their situation, or they've already done things to get their calf crop up to 80, 85% where they can stay in business. But they've done that with feed or with, or, or maybe they planted a Bermuda grass pasture and they're doing, you know, they're doing that sort of thing. But they've done something to mitigate that. And so we think 10% is something that's a reasonable expectation for most people will get at least that big of an improvement. We have a 5% um, improvement in calf death rate. 
and we'll hear this a little bit uh, as we go through uh, experiences with people having light calves, agalactia, especially with fall calving cows. Um, I, we fall calve, and, and about, it, about every fourth year I'll go out uh, during the calving season. I got a little calf shrunk up and kind of staggering around that was born five days earlier. I go to the mama and not a bit of milk. And even though we try to do everything we can, we can have those situations. And, uh, and so those calves, it's not unusual to have calves die. Also, you know, thick placentas, some of these things, they some smother to death, some abort. We have some dystocia that we think is related to it. So there are some calf death losses. And then the $10... Uh, in the bottom thing here is that extra cost to kind of feed your way out or, or uh, in my case, we have a lot of lameness that gets treated that probably is related to fescue and so we have some antibiotic costs that, that we probably could avoid if we had all non-toxic fescue. So, uh, so we got to take that into account. So uh, the, the, you, you're not seeing this, I'm going to go to the next slide but to, to make the last point, but you can see that the, the, co the total cost is, uh, you know, it's like a thousand dollars a cow. So it is not a, it is not a small cost. Uh, and so it's, you know, we, we need to be very careful as we work with producers and make sure that they understand that, that it is quite a costly thing to get into. <clears throat> now, uh, just a few words about Missouri versus the East Coast costs. What you'll see is that every, every practice, like custom spraying, custom planting, Nitrogen price is higher on the East Coast than it is in Missouri, and I, I didn't realize it was that different. But as we started talking on that phone, it was like, man, wait a minute, let's, what do you mean? And, uh, and the truth is, you can get a lot of custom work done in Missouri. They've got big spray rigs. They got, now, they don't always like to go on pastures, I hear, but, but nevertheless, you can get somebody to come do it. Where I live, you can't even get anybody to come do it. I've got to do it all myself. And, and my costs are way even higher than this for some things like spraying and other stuff. So uh, the, one, the one thing that we do have, though, is the value of the grazing is actually higher here because, all the, because hay costs, all of those other costs are, are higher. And so we get more value from pasture uh, because the alternatives are more expensive. And that's, that's a, a benefit. But uh, the years to pay back, given all those assumptions I said in the base model, the years to pay back are a little less than five years uh, in Missouri and a little over five years on the East Coast. And um, that's one of the stumbling points in this. That's a long time to wait to get to where you break even on that investment. Now the positive thing is after you've broke even on the investment, then everything after that time is you get all the benefits of the changes to the non-toxic. That all goes on the positive side. Uh, and so things really start to look good after that point. But you've got to be aware it's going to take a long time to recover those initial investments uh, in the base model assumptions. And so we'll, we'll say more about that as we go through. So the three systems, this is the last one where I'm going to really compare the three systems. And whether you look at either, either of the East Coast or the Missouri costs, the, the most the most expensive system turns out to be this spray, winter smother and spray system. Uh, about seven years here, if we just think about where we are, compared to that 5.5 with the spray, smother, spray. And then the spray, weight spray, about four years. So considerably quicker turnaround on that uh, in terms of, uh, of the payback. And again, John is going to give you the details of that system and talk a little bit about some of the advantages and disadvantages uh, of it. Now, the, the stocking rate in this is set at three acres of cow. And, uh, and as we talked about it, you know, there's a lot of variation in what people's stocking rate is. And that's an important factor. If it's taken you four acres to keep a cow and you have to generate, you have to renovate all four of those acres, that's going to be a lot more expensive than somebody that's doing it on two acres per cow because they, they only have to renovate a smaller area. So, um, uh, you know, so that's going to be an important factor, and I, I think that we'll, we'll get into that here in one of the later slides. But the key drivers of the re renovation economics, as we went through this, and the things I'm going to talk about from here on out, stocking rate turns out to be an important one, and then how much improvement you get in your performance is another very important uh, factor. So how much improvement do you get in calf weights? How much improvement can you have in breeding rate? How much improvement can you get in this calf crop survival? And these become, again, those of you that work with producers and advise them, this is a really important point. Because we generalize and we say, well, if you 
plant this novel fescue, you're going to get a 10% improvement in your, in your breeding rate, right? Well, if you're talking to somebody that's at 95, they're like, no, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm not going to. And maybe they've done a whole lot of things to, to, to get themselves to that point. If they've got a really well-designed system with some toxic fescue, but some Bermuda grass and some other non-toxic fescue or whatever already, then maybe they, maybe they won't get any improvement, and that's an important point. Uh, is the pasture at its full yield potential? And this becomes a very important point. Um, a really great stand that's fully productive, it, it's a lot harder to pay that off than one that really is just not producing any grass and you need to do something with it. If it's really a really good pasture, it's hard to pay that off. It's hard to kill that and pay it off. And that's a little different than what we've told folks sometimes in the past. And then the last point that I'll really spend a fair bit of time on is this question of do, does all of the acreage need to be renovated? Uh, and, and there's some research that suggests that may not be true. We need more research to really fully understand that, but uh, we'll use the research we have and we'll ask that question and talk a little bit about it. Okay, and anybody that has questions, ask as we go. Anybody got one at this point? Okay, it looks like everybody's following, so yes, Reed. Does the cost there with the, the smuggler crop methods, does that include kind of the increased production that you typically get out of annuals and the sometimes additional grazing that you can get from that? It includes, okay, it's primarily targeted at folks with cow-calf. Mm -hmm. So it's based on, cow gra on the increase in cow grazing okay. days. Now they will have a little, you know, they will get a little more body condition. They'll do a little bit better on that, and that's not I, that's not in there at this point. There's a lot of other, you know, we could get a lot of other detail in this, but that one's not there. But it does account for the extra grazing days that you get out of that summer annual, and it, it is an important thing. Uh, depending on the farm, that may be some benefits to having that high quality forage uh, there in the middle of the summer. It's important, I think, to point out that those numbers are very conservative. We were not really trying to. Absolutely. Yeah, we could have. We could. Yeah. How much it'll cost you? Well, almost worse. Yeah. Well, yeah. And not only that, but but also what what you're going to gain. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. So that an example would be that 10% breeding rate. I mean, if you're spring calving, it could be bigger than that. It really could. It probably will be. But if you're fall calving, it, it it's not. But it it'll probably be in that. It'll probably be in that range. So let's go back and and follow this through and. Uh, with the with stocking rate, I think this is, I, I said this, and I think it, it's not surprising that it comes out like this. And I want you to just keep remembering this five and a half. That's the base model. That's kind of what comes out with all those assumptions I said. And we had three acres per cow on that. Uh, as we talked about it, uh, the range is about 3.7 acres or, or, or 3.7 years if we have two acres per cow. And that 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 practical range is somewhere between two and five. Apparently, there's some folks in Missouri that run five acres per cow, uh, but if you have to renovate all of that to get the benefits, then nine years to pay that back. So, so it's pretty sensitive to stocking rate, and if you're in this three, four, five acres per cow, you probably got other things to think about before you think about, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna convert all that. And I had a farm I worked with, it's not a fescue, well, it was a toxic fescue situation in that, in that case, and uh, they, were, they were putting on about a ton of lime every other year because it was a system that was really acidic. And they were running five acres per cow. And we sat down and did the economics. There was no way. And they, they made the decision, we're going out of the cattle business. And that was the right decision for them. But, but we've got to just, this stocking rate thing can really get your costs out of hand if you, if you start looking at it. Now, improvement in breeding rate. And again, uh, if we look at this and range it from about zero, if you don't get any improvement, 30 if you're in a really bad situation, and 10 being, the, again, that five and a half year payback, um, it's, it's pretty sensitive to that. Uh, and so if you're, you know, if you're down, if you could improve it 20%, let's say if you're in the 70s, 75, 73, you're in and you're out, you probably can get, uh, potentially could get a 20% improvement and that would cut, you know, several years, a year and a half actually off the, uh, the time to pay back uh, for this system. Where if you don't get any improvements, in breeding rate, it's a decade. I mean, the, the breeding rate becomes one of the, as, as you said, the breeding rate is one of the biggest economic drivers of this whole thing. Now, calf death loss, this is one that I, 
Uh, we do pretty good on our breeding rate because we're fall calving. We're still in the high 80s uh, with a, a mostly toxic system. But at home, we, we do have calf death losses uh, around this 5%. Uh, year in year out average that we think is related to toxic fescue. So, uh, so if you have none, seven years. If you have a lot of them, say you're losing 15%, again that uh, less than four years. So, so pretty sensitive to this, but not quite as sensitive as this breeding rate uh, change might be. Okay, these pastures need renovation. And uh, this is a pasture I pass on the way to our farm, uh, and, and sometimes I just wonder. There's cows grazing out here. They continuously graze it, and there is grass there, but they're probably getting half the production or less that they could out of this land. They could have twice as many cows uh, if, they, if they would do something and, and manage this system. And, uh, and so everybody, you know, this is an extreme example, but everybody, especially this year, all, everybody has some pastures that they may look at and say, man, i got to do something. This one, you know, it was... It, was, it needed renovation last year, and this year it's destroyed because of the way that it's been so wet and difficult to, to, to graze without pugging up pastures. And so that's where we need to be thinking about renovating instead of pastures that are in, uh, or maybe our best pastures that are in really good shape. So the way that we, we looked at that, we said, okay, if we go to that year three, and I showed in the, in the spreadsheet the default is we come back to the same level of production. But if we can get some benefit in, in extra cow, cow grazing days uh, from the acres that we renovate, then that, uh, that we, we can go from that five and a half that assumes no improvement in total cow grazing days. We cut, start cutting some years off of it. And you see it's not that sensitive to this, but you, do, uh, you can pay it off a, a year or two earlier if you do get some improvements. And 100 cow grazing day per acre is... Um, it is maybe a doubling of yield from that pasture if you think about that. The, so the 150 is extreme. That would be about a 75% improvement in yield on a lot of these pastures. But uh, again, something we need to think about that that, uh, that does matter uh, and, and, and brings us back over to this statement that if you have land that needs to be renovated, seriously, cons I mean, put a novel into fight. There's, it's almost a no-brainer. Don't, don't put toxic fescue back where uh, we're... where pastures need to be renovated. So the next point is this final, this final question of do you need to renovate all of the pasture with novel endophyte? And this is something that I guess as we, as we started, to, again, a year and a half, two years ago when we started talking with this group, this was one where we had to talk about this a lot because the general feeling was, well, we need to get rid of all toxic fescue and replace it all. And, uh, and, of course, our, our seed company partners that, that are in this, I mean, that's kind of what they would like us to say, right? But, <laughs> but, uh, but on the other hand, if that makes nobody, if, if that scares everybody off, then what have we done? And so there's some research from Arkansas, and you've already seen this once, and you're going to see it again. Uh, but what they showed was that when they took spring calving, a uh, spring calving system, and they took and they renovated 25% of the acres to non-toxic fescue, that they completely recovered their breeding rate. And so instead of that 48% or whatever it was, they got it up to 80, which is the same as if they renovated all of the toxic acres to novel endophyte. So that's, that, that's pretty big. Now, now, if you look at the data, we, you know, they didn't get all the improvements. They got no improvement in weaning weight. The weaning weights were the same. But if you think about it, the way that they used this, they used it very strategically by putting the cows in there before the breeding season and during the breeding season. So they got the toxins out of them about a month ahead of the breeding season, and, uh, and, they, and they overcame that breeding problem. But then they were out. They had to go back to toxic fescue because it was an all-fescue system. They had to go back to toxic, toxic fescue for the late summer and fall when it's so toxic. And the calves had to, you know, the cows and the calves had to deal with those toxins still, but it, it, it overcame the breeding problem. So if you put that in the model and you say, okay, I'm going to renovate 25% of the acreage and I'm going to get this 10% improvement in breeding rate. That's, we're back to this same assumption. That takes it from a, a five and a half years to two years. So that one is really big, and and so I, and I'll I'll make that point again as we go through because that that's encouraging me. What that says is that first step you take, even if you do decide I'm going to renovate it all, that first 
experience with it and then strategically using it to solve your problem or to help solve your problems, that'll be the biggest payback. And, and I like the idea because then if it works, then they're going to be like, man, I'm going to renovate this over here next because I got such benefit from the first. And the benefit will be a little less because you're not going to get any more improvement in breeding rate by the next renovations, but you'll start getting the weaning weight. So, so I think that it's a, it, it actually is something that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm pretty excited about, about finally understanding how that works. So let's talk about some various strategies or scenarios you could use. Again, these are the, the, the defaults for Missouri and for the East Coast, and these are all East Coast from here down. But if you need, if your pastures, all your pastures need renovation and you go through this and do it, uh, and you get a 100 cow grazing day improvement across the farm per acre, then that'll cut it from five and a half years to three years. So pretty quick, pretty quick turnover uh, uh, payback compared to that, that standard. Now, there's some other assumptions in here of what benefits you get from doing less and less of the acreage. But just drop here to the 25% of the acreage. That's where that 1.9 years or two years. And then if that 25% needed renovation and you get the benefit of the yield on that, then it comes down to like one and a half years. So, so again, strategically renovating pasture that needs to be renovated and then using it strategically for, to help cow performance or calf performance is really uh, where the big, the big payback is going to be early on. Now, we're going to go and talk in Kentucky at the last one. And, and the Kentucky folks, a lot of people spring calf. And I think all the other locations, most people fall calving. You guys are fall calving because of it. Uh, yeah, okay. So there's some spring calving there. But we want to make sure that we, that we go back to this Arkansas data. And they had a, a much less of an effect in the fall. Uh, in, that should say fall calving, by the way. So fall calving... They had less than half the impact that they had on spring calving, so it was, you know, it was, uh, you know, it, it was much less of an issue with fall calvers. So um, the cow production uh, responses are 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 much less in the toxic. Uh, pregnancy rates similar between toxic and non-toxic. Uh, weaning weights are also quite similar, and then there's a lack of heat stress. Uh, and, uh, and well, because of the lack of heat stress during breeding and the fact that the alkaloids decline during the winter in stockpiled fescue. So both of those help explain why fall calvers are not impacted as well. But it's important to understand, despite all of that, toxicosis concerns are still not alleviated. You still have toxins you have to deal with. Again, my cow, I, t I told the group the other day, I love, I love April. Because the cows come out, you know, we come out of the winter, they got some grass to eat, toxins are low, they start to gain body condition, everything's great. And then I typically, about mid-May, I go out there and it's just like, oh no, okay, it's, it's that time. It's 85 degrees, they're all laying in a mud hole, they've suddenly, they've gone from being really great looking a month earlier to where they look like they're going to die. And I just, I, I feel awful about it. Uh, and, and you could still have some fescue foot and some of those kinds of things. So... Uh, so we're, we're not, just because we switched to fall calving, maybe we stay in business, but we still have a problem. Now, this is some of the detail, last detailed uh, data I'm going to show you, but this is from that, uh, this is from that uh, Arkansas study as well. And, and, and just to give you the full thing of what they did, they had spring calvers, they, they, did, uh, they had toxic, which is the zero, they had the 25% renovation, and they had this 100% 100 renovation. And then in the fall, they did either zero or 25% renovation. And uh, the point that, that uh, we wanted to make is that the, 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 returns, the, the, the returns from that study were around $200 per cow uh, for the spring calvers. And you can see that differed a little bit by, the, by the, what, how much uh, renovation they did. But the fall calvers, they had a considerably higher uh, return, about $270 bucks compared to around $210 or so for the average on the spring. So there, was, you know, so there is some real viable uh, data to suggest that maybe a, uh, a fall calving system is more suited to these, uh, these cows on toxic fescue. Uh, so just keep that in your mind. So to summarize, uh, you know, there's no question it's costly. We're looking at $1,000 or more per cow to renovate the whole farm. So it's not surprising that producers you know, in general are, uh, you know, think, man, that's expensive. Um, and we need producers to evaluate their losses to guide that decision making. And so this is the next step of this is to, 
finalize this spreadsheet and get it into agent training and, and that sort of thing so that our agents can sit down with the producer and put in what they think their numbers are and, and help them to make that decision on a case-by-case -case basis. It pays most to renovate pastures that need to be renovated. I think that's a, I don't know why that seemed like a novel thing to figure out, but, uh, but it, it makes sense to me. And only renovating a portion of the pastures may actually be the most practical approach uh, to get people started on this. And then, of course, changing the fall calving, uh, if you haven't already done that, uh, if you can't rent, do a lot of renovation, is something that we really need to, uh, to be thinking about, and certainly in this area. Now, a little bit of comment of what, of what Nick said. Sometimes we make the mistake of assuming that economics is what motivates all of our producers and that if you can show them the numbers and the dollars that they'll, they'll either do it or not do it, right? We, we just assume that that's true. <clears throat> but we, we have lots of good producers that don't do things that make economic sense and we wonder why. But it's because that's not the main thing that motivates people. People that have a 25 cows and a, a high paying job somewhere, it, it's not always the thing that they're thinking about. I can make 25 more dollars or $50 a cow. Uh, and so sometimes, and, and, and that works both ways. Sometimes they'll do something that, that is going to be costly. It's neat when they do that. But then there's other times they don't do anything because they're like, well, I don't need the 25 bucks. So why would I go to all that trouble? So, you know, you see slides like this, and this is my own personal experience. I told Craig, when we started talking about this, I've never seen fescue foot, Craig, and I've never had it, and I got some lameness, I know, but I've never had this, I, and I, I accused him of overusing that one slide, you know, it's everybody uses that same slide, it's like maybe that's the only cow that ever really, we ever, we really got a good picture of this, I wonder how many times it happens, and he said, well, it doesn't matter how many times it happens, it's when it happens to a farmer, they'll never forget it, you know, it's just, it's, it's, one, it's one of those, and you'll see it later on the video, so I, I went uh, last winter, I had actually had my grad student with me, uh, Sam, who's working on a fescue project. And we went to, we went to our farm and, and it had been below freezing for eight days at that point. Without getting, you, you guys remember that, last, de, last January, I think it did the same thing here. Yeah. And I had this steer that was lame. And he was real lame. And I thought, wow, that's weird. So we got him up and this is what, this is what we saw. And uh, two weeks later, that whole thing fell off. We got him back up again, and when he, when he was in the, he walked into the chute, and by the time he got up the chute, he'd left his foot back at the beginning of the chute, and I went and got it and picked it up. And this is him that next summer, you know. So this is an animal welfare thing. And, and we don't talk or think a lot about that, but when, we've, when we have Kentucky 31, and we understand it, and we continue to use it, we are knowingly feeding our cows Poison, toxin. I mean, that's, that's terrible toxin. Like ergot toxin. It's, it's bad stuff. We know about it. So, is it, so it becomes an ethical problem. And, uh, and, and, you know, I hope it never comes back to haunt us in a big way. But we, the more people that understand this, really, this, this is really what's going on, the more pressure we're going to get from just the general public. Why do you let that happen? I mean, why, why, why in the world would you do that? And, um, and we, we might respond, well, it's because the only way that we can stay in business, right? And then they might suggest, well, maybe you should sell your cows and go out of business. I mean, it's cruel. Well, they may have a point. So we've got to think about that as we, as we think about, as Nick said, what are the non-economic factors going on here? And certainly, a lot of the producers we have, they start thinking about this, then they, may, they will make the decision to do the right thing. Again, because they've, they've got a little bit of money and they want to be proud of what they've got and they want to think that they're good for animal welfare. So keep that in your mind.